Hello and welcome back to LCA TV. My name is James Bromberger and joining me on the couch is Michael Davis. We're very lucky now to have a keynote speaker from two years ago. From two years uh, Karen ago. Karen Sandler. Hello Karen, how are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be back. Now is this your first one since, was it 2012 it you were in Ballarat? Yeah, two years ago. Excellent. Wow. So is it your second LCA in total? Or it's my second LCA. Brilliant. Good to have you back. I'm but, really excited. But it won't be your last. Absolutely not. Good, you're addicted like <laughs> the rest of us. So, uh, have you been talking at this LCA? I have, I have. What have you been talking about? So, uh, in the main track, I talked about uh, bringing more women to free and open source software. So, at the GNOME Foundation, we run an outreach program for women, yep. in which we, um, instead of taking a lot of time where we think in, um, and discuss in agonizing detail about why women might not be coming to our space, instead, we take any of those reasons that we think could be possible, and we try to find solutions to overcome them. And we've had great success so far. Have you had any quantifiable data? How, how has that changed? So, well, so a number of things. Um, one is that, so we started this off with um, just inside GNOME, and we've been doing this with, with interns in GNOME. And in um, before, as we started the program, as actually it was a reboot, but it, it's a long story, so I won't get into it. But in 2009, we rebooted the program, and um, we had about 4% of women at WADEC, which is our annual conference. I saw a photo floating around. I think you had your projection. Yeah, exactly. And now 4% isn't actually that terrible to have women in free and open source software because the actual statistic on women generally in free and open source software is like one to three percent. But after we had launched the outreach program for women, we now, in the last quarter, we had 18% women, wow. which corresponds to the number of women in proprietary software development. So at least we've reached the gap between three <laughs> thousand. It's still not great. But it's an achievement. It's, it's getting that equality. It is. It's, it's a, a good, good step forward. And I guess it's really the derivative, right? You know, it's about the change. You want it to be moving in the right direction. You know, there's no point getting to 18% and then see us go back down again. We want to see that improve. That's exactly right. right. And then we had so much success with, success with GNOME. And there are other like small areas that you can see that it was successful. Like women who came through the program are now mentors in the program. So it's like kind of running itself in a way. Um, one of our participants is now on the board of directors of the GNOME Foundation and is our treasurer. Another is on our membership committee. And all of them are very, very, not all of them, but many of them are very, very active on desktop develop and on uh, lists that are very vocal. So we had so much success that we realized we could not keep it to ourselves. Good. So we now have invited other free software projects to join us. And we have now over 20 free software organizations joining us, including the Linux kernel, Mozilla, Wikimedia, um, Debian, Fedora, I mean, it, the list goes on. It's pretty pretty great. And then of those organizations, they have now started to see a lot of concrete success, like Wikimedia, before joining the Outreach Program for Women, had never had more than one ever applicant to Google Summer of Code. Yes. And after they participated with us for a single round, they had seven participants in Google Ooh. Summer of Code. That's so it's, it's amazing. And then um, after this last round, where we had the Linux kernel um, participate, the outreach program for women was on the top list of employers yeah. um, for uh, changes in uh, the 312 kernel release. So it's actually like like not even at the bottom of the list of notable employers. So it's pretty cool. Very so cool. So I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah. So uh, as part of my involvement, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs for this conference for the Papers Committee, right? And so in my talk that I gave earlier this week, uh, just I think it would be interesting in this. Um, uh, both in the papers committee itself, we aim for, we're aiming to try improve the gender balance, and but also then we start looking at selecting talks. We try to do the same thing as well. Mm. Now it's not just a case of finding anyone to talk, but it's a case of finding you know finding the success stories, you know finding the people who are contributing and get them in and, and to really you know increase that profile. So I think you know we're, we're approaching this on a number of different fronts, and so we're we're trying to make it happen, aren't we? So well, since we're having this public discussion, I can put you on the spot and say, <laughs> why didn't you accept any of my GNOME talks and only my outreach program? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. No, but what I do like is that Mike is now blushing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I only mentioned that to say that there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in GNOME as well. Absolutely, and absolutely. I, I, I should point out that, um, that one of the reasons why I love working for and being involved with the GNOME Foundation is because it's the environment where we create solutions like this. You know, it's a, yes. such a warm, proactive community. Yes. And it's the kind of place where you would launch an outreach program for women and having success. And, you know, it was really beneficial for the GNOME project early because we were getting a lot of funding for the new developers coming in and we only accept really exceptionally talented women into the program yes. so we were getting all these exceptionally talented women but of course it's the GNOME Foundation so we couldn't just make it for the GNOME Foundation yeah. so so we, we turned it into a free software benefit and I think this is true of the GNOME Foundation generally when we find a good solution we try to make it more you know practical for everyone mm. and so and, and we're really focused on improving the state of free software generally Absolutely. so um, you know so I, I, I'm 
You know I'm the luckiest uh, girl in the world. <laughs> I feel that way. Now awesome. I am going to address that because uh, just to say that you know we only take talks from uh, we take one talk per speaker. That's just our rule mm -hmm. because uh, we you know we have so many people who want to talk. We have so many papers, and so you know we, we took that one from you because we thought that was the more important one. But, okay. Okay. So sorry about that. But, no you know, problem. No problem. I'm just giving you a hard time. No, that's fine. Good. Send more known people. Send more known people. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Great. Okay, cool. I think, I think giving more people the opportunity to speak at an absolutely. LCA is actually um, almost a career progression for them to get yeah. up to that point where they can take to the snake and start to talk about it. So, yeah, the more people, the better. Let's we'll um, do that. Are we allowed to talk about uh, your keynote from two years ago? I wanted absolutely. to find out what's changed since then. Do you want to give us a summary of what you spoke about and, absolutely. and give us an update of what's happened? Yeah, sure. Um, so, what I spoke about two years ago is that um, it's my own bizarre personal situation and, um, and why I've become truly passionate about software freedom. And that is because while I was involved with the free software community, I was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center and giving pro bono legal advice to free and open source software projects, I discovered that I had a heart condition. So I literally have a very big heart, which means I'm, I'm asymptomatic, but I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. And the short story is that um, I'm, I'm safe if I have a pacemaker defibrillator because if I go into sudden death, it will shock me and um, and it will revive me and it, that'll, that'll be great. But of course, I asked, what does it run? You know, what is the software on the device? And got nowhere with the medical device manufacturers. So I, I realized that I had to get the device, but I promised myself I would do all the research. So I did a lot of research in the United States on the role of the Food and Drug Administration and their overview of, um, of software. And it won't surprise anybody to hear that they're really isn't very much review at all. And so, um, you know, I, I made the case for software freedom for all critical devices, not just medical devices, but anything that we rely on for our society and our lives, like, you know, our, our cars, our voting machines, our stock markets. And, um, you know, I think it's it's kind of a, um, a, a nice way to talk about software freedom because while it's an issue that's very stressful for me because I literally have proprietary software screwed into my heart. Yes. <laughs> um, so while it's stressful for me every time to talk about it, it's worthwhile because when people hear my personal story, they sort of can see, you know, software is something that is very abstract. It's something that ordinary people don't necessarily understand. And talking to them about the morality of their software is like talking to them about a morality of a hammer. You yes. know, it's a tool. They don't really see it. But when you talk about, when you talk to someone and say, my life relies on this software, right. it becomes a completely different story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and what's changed since then? Sadly, not very much. I still have Happily, the battery in my device is still good, so uh, I have a device that doesn't have any wireless component to it, but it's running out, so I'm going to have to face this issue all over again. Um, the Food and Drug Administration has come out with a warning in, um, in June saying that, hey everybody, these devices might not be secure. Medical device manufacturers, you should be aware that your devices may be vulnerable. Please take appropriate steps to ensure that they are not. Not, not reassuring news. Not reassuring news, nothing new, no real concrete recommendations. Um, software transparency was not mentioned at all, nor was, you know, so it was a little, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it's on the, you know, it's on the radar at the, the FDA and people are understanding, people finally, I mean, my doctors, my original set of doctors would not acknowledge that this was a potential problem. Mm. So at least by the FDA, and, and one electrophysiologist literally hung up on me on the phone when I was talking to him about it. So, so you know, what's come out this year, and um, you know, you, you, I'm sure you know this, but uh, they were talking about Defence Secretary Powell with his yes. pacemaker, and he had custom software on his pacemaker. They modified it because they were afraid of the threat. Like Dick Cheney. Oh, it was Dick Cheney, was it? Dick a Cheney. Child? Okay, sorry, I got the person yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. But it was, it was a case of, here we are. You know, yes. we, we are actually concerned for this individual. So we actually went as far as modifying the software on his pacemaker yeah. before we gave it to and him. They wouldn't have done that with any actual no. real no, reason to it. do it. No, but what it no. shows is it's not a theoretical well, attack. This is where mm. I was getting to next: is that if Dick Cheney is worried about it, then you know, shouldn't everyone who has a pacemaker to be worried about it? He's definitely a target. Uh, Correct. A lot Correct. of people don't like him. Correct. <laughs> Correct. But uh, but still, you know, I mean, so it, so that was the second thing. Then the third thing that happened um, since then is that um, Barnaby Jack. Um, I don't know. If you guys know about Barnaby Jack, he I've was heard the name. A, yeah, he was. In, there's this fly. This is yes, why I'm it's like, us, yep. yeah, kung fu. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Barnaby Jack was this amazing, amazing guy who actually had heard my talk on medical devices, and um, that partially inspired him to do all this work on medical devices. He was famous for his his last name was Jack. Yes. And so he was famous for what they called jackpotting, where he would connect huh. his computer to a cash machine, a cash point, and he would get it to spit out money yes. and it would flash jackpot 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 <laughs> and he would do this in like a like in talks so yeah. that it was it was quite stupid you know and uh, he died 
um, kind of mysteriously before presenting some of his results on, um, on hack. He was able to show uh, that you could deliver a fatal shock with a pacemaker defibrillator um, and a lethal dosage with an I implanted insulin pump. Mm. And so he, I've, I've, it's really, I mean, it's sad because he was such a good guy and he mm. did amazing, exceptional work and the work was so colorful and he had a real, like, presenters flair right, for right, it, right. you know? Mm, that, um, that big persona. Yeah, exactly. So um, so it's a huge loss um, in, in, in for, for the field, and it's really sad personally, and it's sad for me because we kept meaning to get together to take it to the next level, mm, and, mm. you know, he was in San Francisco and I was enabling our call, and, you know, it's one of those things where you have to do the work that you want to do when you have the opportunity, and mm. never, you might not have the opportunity later. Yeah, that's great so, advice. That's great advice. But the good thing is, is that because he, or one of the good things that came out of his death is that it brought some more attention to the issue. Absolutely. So while it's it's incredibly sad, at least there was one last you know benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you touched on it earlier about about vehicles. We've seen a, a lot of kits. I think now for sale in the last quarter or so of remote control for certain vehicles that are being sold out of Russia, um, where you can suddenly take over and, and accelerate the vehicle. So it's not just just people with pacemakers, but it's oh no, potentially in the next couple oh, of years. Oh, there's that, that great Prius hack, like where they could take over the Prius and yes. uh, oh my gosh. I mean, if it, viewers, if you have not seen this video, go online and check out like Prius hack. It's amazing. Really? Oh yeah. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen oh, it. Oh, you should take a look. It's like, holy cow, you can totally take over the entire car's right, operation. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it just, just goes to show that with all, you know, we are adding operating systems and, and, and wireless interfaces to all these different things. And, and all of a sudden it's like, well, what's happening with this information? Both from Absolutely. A, you know, just a, can we take over this device? You know, is it tracking? You know, I mean, you look at what happened last week uh, with Coke. Uh, uh, Coca-Cola has uh, been allocated the largest number of MAC addresses ever. For Coke machines, I would imagine? They haven't said what are you going to use them for. Mm. But, so they're going to put a little wireless controller in every Coke can? Nobody knows. But it's just another, you know, technology is just taking over every area of our lives and the whole privacy and security thing is such a big deal. And yeah. we don't know how they're going to interact with one another is the thing, and that's exactly the point that you right. were making. And with the cars, I mean, a lot of times the control through the for the cars is being done through alternate systems that you wouldn't expect to be life critical. Right. Mm. Like, you know, you can right. come through the wheel maintenance system yes. and then come into the rest of the car Yes. from that yes. and you wouldn't necessarily think if you're you know programming the wheel maintenance system that you yes. would have any kind of well see um, uh, John Oxer he did a talk back in Hobart when we were in Hobart a few years ago in 2009 and uh, he, he uh, developed a car interface that he plugged into the, um, you know, the, the diagnostic system and part of that, he, he did some you know pushing and prodding and actually got some schematics from the car manufacturers. But one thing that really showed on these things was it's like, here's the, here's the bus for the entertainment and here's the bus for the, um, you know, the braking system. And here's the, and hang on a second, but they're connected. How can, how can I be pressing a button on the entertainment system and it could potentially affect some of the steering or braking or mm. acceleration components on the vehicle? Yeah. Now, uh, you know, they go through all the security testing and that's fine, but now you add a wireless interface to that and anyone in the street can, can poke that in ways that perhaps the manufacturer hasn't tested. Which when you're going down the freeway at 110 kilometers an hour or so, and right. someone beside you has a laptop open, that's a, that's a huge risk. It is. Or not even beside you. Yes. Indeed. Right. This is, that's, I mean, that's what's so terrifying about yeah. it and, and amazing. And actually, I mean, so I think there's a huge opportunity for free and open source software here, but at the same time, we all know that just because it's free and open source software doesn't mean it's necessarily safe. No. It's Correct. just more likely to be better and safer over time, and it puts in the, like, the mechanisms and the, um, the infrastructure whereby the public can get involved in safety of the software, and it's much harder to, you know, I mean, I always say to people <laughs> when they ask me for a concrete example of how, um, of how this might affect them individually as they are using Skype and the answer is always, why well, yes I'm using Skype, of course I use Skype, everybody right. uses Skype. Right. And then I tell them, well you know, there are known cases of NSA surveillance software, you know, piggybacking right. on Skype installation software. So yes. like if you've downloaded, you, you don't even know what you're downloading. Right. But if it's free and open source software, chances are that there are people out there who are, you know, it looking mean at it quite closely. It doesn't mean it, it necessarily is right. safer right. and there isn't something riding on it, but chances are over time if you use the software that's been verified. Um, you know, if you use software from an, a trusted source. Yes. It doesn't mean that the audit has taken place, but it means that there's an opportunity to have the audit. Absolutely. And right with my, if we go back to my pacemaker defibrillator, you know, I haven't coded in a long time, but you better believe that I would study the software. <laughs> right. My father has one and he also is a programmer, admittedly. You know, his expertise is Fortran. Sure. <laughs> but then but, again, you but know, having said my, that, the software in your pacemaker is probably more likely to be something like Fortran. Probably. Yes. I mean, yeah. it's something very light. I mean, whatever it is, it has to right. be very energy efficient. Yes. But yeah. 
awesome. Yeah. Well, look, um, obviously the noise in here has dropped down because I think court talks are starting up uh -huh. again. So we should thank you very much for thank coming you back guys. to LCA. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Can I say one more thing? Yes. Yes. I think everybody, you know, I just want to say that GNOME has so vastly improved in the last couple of iterations that it's worth giving it a try. Fantastic. So, yeah, so if, if you guys aren't using GNOME 3, if you gave it a try and were frustrated with some of the bugs back then or the, some of the design decisions, um, there have been a lot of changes since then. You've heard what people have said and, and made it better. Yeah, a lot of changes were made based on the feedback that we got, and it is beautiful. So I'm using Ubuntu GNOME Remix. Oh, you are. So, That's quite nice. good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I made, made the switch about three, four months ago. Excellent. So, you and you're happy. You're a happy user. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Cool. Awesome. Karen, thank you ever so much. Thank for you, time. guys. Thank you. <laughs>